Welcome to episode 21 of Mayhem to Measurement. I'm Chris Book, and I am typically joined by Chris Sietzma, and I will be here in a little bit, but you're going to notice something a little bit different today. We have an incredibly special guest. We have Jay Bayer on the show today. If you're uh, even the least bit awake when it comes to marketing, you obviously know Jay Bayer. He's a six-time New York Times bestselling author. He runs an incredible consultancy focused on customer experience called Convince and Convert. He is simply everywhere when it comes to marketing. He's truly a superstar. But for Chris and myself, he's actually played a pretty tremendous role in our careers. He ran a company that both Chris and I worked together at when we were very young. And since then, he's been a great friend to us, and and he's always uh, been an incredible mentor for us as well. So as we started talking, we sat down to record the show. We actually just got so into it, we never actually got around to starting the show. We just got very, very deep down on the path we were going on, and frankly, the audio was so good, it uh, didn't really warrant us stopping and restarting. We were, we were really uh, rolling there for a minute. And once we uh, got to the point later on, we realized, oh, well, now, now we all have other places we have to be. And Jay's got an incredibly busy schedule, and he had to go as well. So what we want to do is we want to be able to share that discussion that we had with you, because really the discussions you have sitting, uh, sitting around the table are probably the most valuable ones, and that's exactly what we had. So Jay is about to release, and I believe sometime in October, we'll talk about it in the show, his upcoming book, Talk Triggers. He wrote that with a man named Daniel Lemon. And it's an incredible book about how businesses use very remarkable events or behaviors to impact their customers to really generate word of mouth marketing. So you might think, what does that have to do with analytics? But actually, it has quite a bit to do with it. And we'll talk about it in the show about how you measure that and about how you optimize based on that. But it's just a really interesting look at more of the practical side of how we use data and insight to actually move our business forward. So we hope you like the episode. If you do like it, definitely give us a shout, info at metricsagency.com. You can also find Jay at Jay Bayer pretty much everywhere. He's a wonderful guy. Definitely give him a shout. Let him know that you heard him See, on the show. See, word of mouth is the and, most, uh, you like what is, he had is, to say. is the hope you enjoy best it. way to build your business and has been for thousands of years. But it's the only thing that nobody has a strategy for. Y- yeah. Like you've got a digital strategy, you've got a social strategy, you got a PR strategy, you got a crisis strategy, but you don't have a word of mouth strategy, which is bonkers to me. Do you find that when you're talking to clients for on the convincing convert side, that they're shocked when they actually kind of peek a little bit behind the curtain and see, oh, word of mouth is kind of a big deal and that they're mm-hmm. just, they are, they're shocked? Are you shocked by their the fact that they're shocked? Uh, I'm not shocked that they're shocked, but they are definitely shocked. And the the, the challenge is... It's not that people don't understand word of mouth is important. They do. It's that they take it for granted. Right? So so the assumption, and I say this in the book and on stage, is that most companies think that competency creates conversation. That the key to, so to, the key to word of mouth is just to be a quote-unquote good business. But that doesn't actually work because pretty much every business is good. Right? So you have to be like so much better than your competition for competency to be your word of mouth angle and very few people can meet that right so you have to do something different something that people remember you've got to give your customers a story to tell and that's the talk that's the whole point of the book is it's an operational choice that you make that creates story so how did that come about did did that did that talk trigger discussion or idea come about from a content marketing exercise no i've been thinking about it for years in fact I, i wrote a post on cnc i looked it up the other day it was like 20 god 2011 Wow. It was like when I first started writing about talk triggers. And it was just something I observed, right? That, that companies who, who, who proactively give people a story to tell can succeed with that story. And I never really thought of it as, you know, a big deal. It was just something I would come back to a time and again, you know, here or there. And then I started to realize like, oh, this is, this is the umbrella. I've been searching for a few years on like, what's the umbrella, right? So What's the umbrella on top of content marketing? What's the umbrella on top of social? What's the umbrella on top of great customer experience or great customer service? I'm like, oh, well, it's word of mouth. Like that's, word of mouth is the point of all this at some level, right? Why would you have a great Instagram account? Well, because somebody sees it and is like, dude, you wouldn't believe this Instagram video I just saw. And, and I'm like, oh, it all sort of like tumbled into place for me. Yeah. You know, after 10 years or really 25 years, if you go back to the digital. Makes perfect so, sense. Yeah. yeah. It, just, it took me a long time to piece it together, but now I'm like, oh. And now we're starting to do a lot of word of mouth strategy consulting, which is a blast. So uh, question on that. So is there a way to, you know, in marketing and like marketing planning, sometimes we try to make a system 
Like, mm-hmm. follow these steps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there is, uh, or do you, what you're doing, um, have you found that there is a system or how, 100%. Much, how much nuance? hundred percent. Yeah. And in fact, there's a lot of books on word of mouth, right? And, and many good ones uh, over the last 25 or 30 years. Seth Godin's Purple Cow, Jonah Berger's Contagious, uh, Ted Wright's Fizz. There's a number of great books on word of mouth. But what none of them have is a, a process that you can use to create a word of mouth strategy in your business. And that's what we put in this book, Talk Triggers. It's a six-step process that any business can use to identify, test, measure, optimize, roll out their own word of mouth generator. And it's the same process we now use at Convince and Convert to build word of mouth programs for clients. We're doing a lot of that kind of work now, um, which is fun. So you're writing with Daniel Mm -hmm. Lemon, and he wrote Manipulated. Yeah. How much of the previous reviews or feedback or information that people have just volunteered go into the strategy? Do you, do you rely at all about yeah. on what people have already said about the company? Like yeah, really good question. Points or... Absolutely. Great question. So so when you start the process of trying to figure out your talk trigger, your differentiator that will create word of mouth, you want to look at, you want, you want to sit down with people in your company that actually talk to customers. So typically sales and customer service, not so much marketing because marketing doesn't do anything. Marketing is not really talking to customers very, very often. I mean, they're just not talking to customers. They yeah. just don't. Yeah. Like, I mean- even when, even when the three of us started, right, we talked to customers a lot more than we talked to customers today because we didn't have the reporting and the analysis and the nuance that we have now. Like we used to have to like have real conversations. That's with an people interesting. To they're figure a trend stuff line. Out. They're just bars and gra- graphs yeah. and pie charts. I mean, what they are to, the, to the, the firm I worked at before Mighty uh, Interactive, my boss said, no good marketing happens at your desk. Is that when? Yeah. And it's really true. It's like, if you really want to know what people think and what they need and what they want, you need to go actually be amongst them. And now we sort of have to run this Google Analytics report. And now I know the answers. Like, well, kind of. You, you, you have one set of answers. And so, so part of the talk trigger solution is to, is to really spend time with people in your company who know what customers want. And the other piece of it is to see what customers are already talking about. So there's an easy exercise I use in some cases. Like if you go to um, Yelp, or TripAdvisor or other sites, you pick any business, it'll give you a word cloud of the words that are most often mentioned in reviews. Like, well, okay, yeah. if, if all of a sudden you see a bunch of people mentioning uh, mermaids in all your reviews, well, you already have the raw materials for a talk trigger. And the reason I say mermaids is there is a bar in Great Falls, Montana, which Great Falls is not easy to get to, even if you live in Montana. And this bar has been around since the 1950s. And this bar was named last year one of the top 10 bars in America worth flying to by GQ magazine. So imagine flying to Great Falls, Montana, to go to this bar. The secret is from 9 o'clock to midnight every night, there's a giant fish tank behind the bar, human mermaids swimming every night. That's a talk trigger. You're going to tell that story. I don't know how to react to that. We got to go. You're going to tell that story. <laughs> I, think, I think we're going to live on to. location. Live on location. Similarly, when I was in New York City, we were watching. My son and I went in September, and I asked the concierge at our hotel, like, "Hey, we want to go watch some college football, preferably Wisconsin Badgers, because we were all into it at the time, and still are. Um, where should we go?" And the guy said, "Well, there's a few, but at this one, Bucky the Badger will show up and dance." And I got my 12 year old there. He was 11 at the time. Michael Shilton, we're going there. Yeah. I mean, Duh. if you get a live live mascot at yeah. the bar, that's a- Count me in. Yeah, yeah, that's a given. So those are the kind of things, right? So look, I, here's the deal. Nobody ever says, let me tell you about this perfectly adequate experience I had last night. Nobody ever says that. But we run our businesses as if that's the secret to word of mouth. Let's just be good. Good's a four-letter word and when it comes to word of mouth. It, it always is, but you know what I mean. So same as lame is what we always talk about in the book and on stage. You've got to do something that people remember, right? You've got to have mermaids. You've got to have a hook, right? You've got to have something that, that makes, uh, makes a difference. So we did a ton of research uh, for the book, and two of the signature case studies are Cheesecake Factory and Doubletree Hotels. Cheesecake Factory has their talk trigger. is They have the biggest menu of any restaurant. 
They sure right. do. It's it's right. the it Bible is, of menus. It is. It, there's yeah. a, there, there's a tweet that I use. That menu. There's a tweet that I use in speeches about this, and it's hilarious. Uh, it it just says we're reading Cheesecake Factory menu for my book club, which I think is <laughs> which I think is hilarious. Uh, and and I had my intern uh, permanently borrow a Cheesecake Factory menu. That's count, a good intern. And, much. Yeah, it is. And count the words: uh, five thousand nine hundred and forty words. Right, the book talk triggers is like fifty three thousand words. Right, so it's like fourteen percent. Five thousand. It's like fourteen percent of a book. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. So they make they make chicken eighty five different ways. Do they spatchcock it? Uh, no, because that's too simple. They may they you know that that that's a that's a <laughs> that's a that's a style, not a flavor. Right. Gotcha. So eighty five ways, uh, which is absurd. Right. So, but that's their talk trigger. So much so, uh, two stats for you. One. Cheesecake Factory spends five times less on marketing than any other restaurant in their core competitive set. 5x, not 5%, 5x. They, they basically don't advertise. And two, I interviewed uh, with my co-author, Daniel Lemon, 1,000 Cheesecake Factory customers. And 38% of them have proactively, without being asked, mentioned the size of the menu to a friend or family member in the last 60 days. And I have four out of 10 customers have talked about this thing. That it's like an inside trigger. joke. Yeah, that's a talk trigger, yeah. right? It's you know probably in a, a more um, well-known example, it's the secret menu at In-N-Out Burger. We didn't use that case study in the book because it's almost pat at this point. It's almost, a, it's almost trite to, to say that, but it's the same idea. Sure. You what know? did you order recently? I had the Flying Dutchman yesterday, and I hadn't been In-N-Out in years. Flying Dutchman, so Joy is celiac, and, yeah. and we try to cut the carbs down and primarily get our carbs this way. Yes. And so... They have a menu item there. It's it's so simplistically brilliant. Instead of doing a lettuce wrap or one of these other mm-hmm. things that falls apart, they use the burger patties as the bun and put everything else between them. Oh, the reverse. It's that's so, like the it's KFC. So that's like the KFC exactly double, yeah. double down or whatever. Yeah. yeah. It's so here's why In and Out's amazing. Not not only is that a secret item on the menu. Basically, I walked in there. I ordered three double cheeseburgers as I was waiting seven hours for an oil change. Okay. Well, I was supposed to have lifetime alignment, but then as I was there for my lifetime alignment, they told me it's now three year alignment. <laughs> because you go to the seats in the garage. Excellent and CX on that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I ordered three of these things. So it's basically three double cheeseburgers yes. ordered. It was six bucks. Yeah. Yeah, and it's all high quality. It's yeah. amazing. Or, or so they tell me. They say Burger King meat. It's yeah. good, good stuff. That's it. It's unbelievable. The Flying Dutchman, that's what it's called? Yeah. Man, I am, Completely I am free. totally making that happen. I did not know that was an option. I'm we do not have an In-N-Out Burger, unfortunately, in Indiana, but uh, but I'm out here in the West often enough. That's one I did not know, and that is right up my alley. Yeah. It's, I, just, I learned this the other day, and it's one of these things like, it's it's so simple. And and so the, the other big case study that we have in the book is Doubletree, right? So when you check in with Doubletree, they give you a chocolate chip cookie. A warm chocolate chip, yeah, and it's a good cookie for real. Uh, they they make seventy five thousand cookies a day. <laughs> they give out, I believe that, and they've been doing it for thirty five years. So we interviewed one thousand DoubleTree guests and found that thirty four percent of them have mentioned the cookie to somebody in the last sixty days. Mm. So the quick math on that, right? Thirty four percent of seventy five thousand people a day is a lot of word of mouth power. 25 right? some odd thousand. It's tons, right? Yeah. Which is why they don't advertise hardly at all. They don't need to. That's why Midwest they, Express needs to come back as an airline, if you remember them. Yes, of course. All first class yes. seats, unlimited chocolate chip cookies. Yes. Wow. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that's how I used to have to come out to Arizona when I was playing all the time. It's like the JetBlue blue tortilla chips. Yeah. Same same premise, right? Mm-hmm. Um, By the way, you know you know what this reminds me of? Ski areas do mm-hmm. this exceedingly well. So for instance, Beaver Creek every day at three o'clock they have 200 chefs walking around with chocolate chip cookies. Really? Yes. I don't know that one. That's and, good. And there are, there are other ski areas that will have Rice Krispie treats. Taking a little step further, Deer Valley out in Utah, every employee there gets $20 a day to spend on a guest to make their day happier. Nice. So when I go to Deer Valley, every time I get on the lift, I start bitching to the guy about something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, man, nothing's working today. I would feel so much better if I just. I sure wish I had chocolate. a nicer watch. <laughs> well, that's pretty much what happens. So you get down, and every time they'll have a Snickers waiting for you, or a hot chocolate, or something. I'm just bitching all oh, day. Man. And meanwhile, I'm you know half diabetic by the time I get home. That that's night. a good one. Negativity pays off. I like no, it. But all these scaries, and there's certain scaries that that will have little s'more packs they hand out every day. They've all got these things. And I was thinking about it when you were talking about 
the first thing I talk about when someone says, hey, I've been to Beaver Creek. Yeah, it's amazing. Unlimited chocolate chip cookies. Right. Has nothing to do with skiing. That's has it. nothing to do with the, with the accommodations with you know I mean? or anything. There's all these tweets uh, about people choosing Double Tree hotels because of the cookie. And I'm like, all right. And the, pro- the cookie's so probably ridiculous. not even that good. It is good. But, oh, let, me, is but okay. let me just let me just like diagnose this. Okay. You are making a hotel selection. A few hundred bucks a night. Based not on the quality of the bed or the location or the gym or the bar or the safety or the claims because it's a cookie. Right. That checks That's, out. It's extraordinary, right? It it really is. And and like look, we spend so much time in marketing now, and I'm I'm as guilty of this as anybody, maybe more so, uh, talking about how can we target better or analyze better or buy more paid ads better or whatever. And at the end of the day, what really good companies do is they let their customers do their marketing for them. Really good companies don't have to ever, right? Because their customers are their market. Absolutely. Uh, and, and I think we lost sight of that a little bit. And, and so I'm trying to kind of bring it back. So to back it up a little bit, obviously there's a, there's a few uh, steps you can take to build out a strategy. Yeah. One of the things that we run into quite a bit, especially on the metrics and analytics side, is that if, if you are within an organization and realize that, hey, we need to look at things a little bit differently or mm-hmm. we need to go buy a tool or we need to adopt a new process. The people that kind of come to that realization aren't in a position to make the decision, and right. they have to sell it up. Right. If if I realize that you know what we don't have a word of mouth strategy, mm-hmm. and we probably need one, but the person that can actually help us do that is up there, yep. and I need to sell that up. Like, what steps would you take to do that? Yeah, it's a really good question. So the one thing you've got to do is is try, if possible. Uh, to map your talkable ratio to actual business outcome, right? So Doubletree knows how much the power of the cookie conversation turns into actual guests, right? They've studied this, and so that's the right right thing to do. The cookie conversation. The cookie conversation. So what 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 smart organizations do is they're really good at understanding um, the net present impact the sort of reach uh, accumulation of word of mouth from customers. Because once you can make that case, you can say, well, look, this is a bunch of people who didn't know about us before, and now they do because our customers have told them that we need to in- invest in this. What's nice, and we certainly recommend this in the book and in the official process that we use, is that you can and should take, we call a candidate trigger, test it, and then measure the talkable ratio. And if the, 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 what we use is about 20%, if you see a 20% talkable ratio, then there's enough there there to consider rolling it out across the enterprise. So you can say only every nth customer gets a cookie or only customers in Texas get a cookie or only customers at this hotel get a cookie, right? And then you want to measure how often those people talk about it. And you do that in a few different ways. One would be looking at social media chatter ratings and reviews, but the best thing to do is to actually uh, do a quantitative survey of those people and say, okay, have you, have, did you notice anything different? Did you tell anybody anything? Right. And, Mermaid, what, hint, and what was it? Yeah. Right. And you always want to test it, uh, aided and unaided. Right. So when we did the study on cheesecake factory and double tree, it was unaided 38% and 34% have mentioned it. Aided. So did you remember something? Yeah. The cookie. Yeah. What did you remember? Cookie. What did what, it no, was Actually, what did you tell the cookie? Or the size of the menu. Wait, what is it? What did you? What did you tell? Oh, gotcha. Who did you? What did you say something to anybody about the business? Yes. What was it? When it's aided and you give them a pick list of things, it's over fifty percent. Oh wow. Yeah. So you always want to measure it both ways. So once you have that kind of data, right? Um, you can say, well, look, look at this. Look at what we're spending to create awareness. Now, here's a way we can create awareness at a much lower cost. So once the need is realized, like, dude, we need a word of mouth strategy. We need to get on this yesterday. It sounds like it starts with a research project. Is that fair? It's an internal conversation about customer needs uh, combined with some customer behavior, sort of anthropology work to kind of get a handle on what's going on. So what we what we recommend is mapping all your customer touch points because every talk trigger has to be deployed at, at, at an intersection between the brand and the, or, the customer, right? So you really do a customer journey map. 
and say, all right, here's the customer journey map. What are all the places that we have them on the phone, via email, via text message, in person? You know, what are all those places? And then what we do is we, we do a whole series of interviews with customers, and we want to interview three types of customers. Uh, new customers, long-time customers, and lost customers. And you interview all those customers, and you say, at each of these touch points, what did you expect from us? Because once you can measure and document what they expect, then you can do something that they don't expect. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you create this whole map that says, okay, here's the seven touch points based on these interviews. And it's maybe 10, 12 customers per, per use case. It's not a like, massive study, just enough qualitative. Here's the seven touch points. Here's what they expect at each touch point. Okay. Now we know what they expect. What can we do that they don't expect, right? And there's five different types of talk triggers that we then pick from, right? There's generosity talk trigger, which is a uh, free cookie, right? There's empathy talk triggers, there's responsiveness talk triggers, et cetera. And so you figure out which of these kind of feels right to your organization. And then you put together a list of candidate options. Well, we could do this, or we could do this, or we could do this. And then we have uh, what we recommend and what we do at Convince to Convert is we uh, basically take those candidate ideas, five or six options, and we put them on a graph, and we graph it by uh, viability and proposed impact, because some things are harder than others, right? So, so having a cookie oven in every hotel is kind of a pain in the ass. Like you got to buy an oven sure. and install it behind the front desk, and train people to make cookies, right? And build a supply chain, right? So, so that's not a layup, right? So. There are some talk triggers that are easier to execute, so that's that's a viability score. And then proposed impact is it's a bit of a, a bit of a gut check at this point. It's like, all right, all else being equal, how remarkable that's the word we use. How remarkable do we believe customers will find us? And so what you're looking for for your first rollout is something that's kind of in the middle of of both of those, both of the X and the Y. Medium complexity, medium impact is the best place to start. Uh, roll it out, test it, like we talked about. So every nth customer, certain circumstances, and then you check for the the talkability of it. And then if you're like, oh, people are actually chattering about it, then you roll it out across the team. Got it. And do you introduce a trigger at every single touch point? No. Or do you identify no, the most question. crucial no, one? No, great question. Usually just one. A very few businesses have more than one. Uh, because if your customers won't tell more than one story. And it right? gets confusing and It muddled. gets confusing for yeah. them. Like you, yeah. just, you just mentioned, like Beaver Creek, it's cookies. Right, they give you cookies. Yeah. Right, it's not like cookies. And then they also do this thing where it's free parking. Now, now you may have other attributes, and that, that's where you know you may have other customer experience attributes that are desirable, right? That are even substantially better than competition. But from a, we are going to strategically craft a portable story. You want one, but it, it's funny to me because this story can almost craft itself on the negative side of that equation. Mm -hmm. So you, you have companies. happens all the time. So, you know, for all the times, negative I talk company, trigger, very common. Yeah. And, and, and so it's not something you're actively doing. United Airlines. But it, it exactly. recently. So, so I worked for a company that would send 12 emails to people every single day to like. That was at a company that I owned because we did work together. Correct. Okay, just checking. No, so I just want to make sure. We didn't no. send 12 a day. Chris is, is, Chris is in charge of email. So maybe, <laughs> I mean, that, I'm so like guilty. The, the, yeah. this, this was nothing that uh, that anybody I you know, willingly associate with at the moment had anything to do <laughs> okay, with. Okay, good. Just checking. But of course, yeah, I got I got relatives. I got people I don't know. I got business school people calling me up. You know, people I never even met saying, hey, I'm getting all these emails. What the hell? That's a talk trigger. It yes. ain't a good one. Yes. But that is what yes. you are known for. Absolutely. And, and what's also funny is that sometimes you can, and we talk about this in the book because we got this question from a lot of clients, like, well, what if it doesn't work? Or what if it doesn't work anymore? So two examples there. You may remember that Weston Hotels, I don't even know, I should look it up. It's probably seven years ago now, something like that. They started this thing called the Heavenly Bed, yeah, where they're going to have the, the raddest, most comfortable bed in all of the hotel land. And they put all this emphasis into it, marketing and built all these amazing mattresses and, and that was their talk trigger. The nicest beds. Well, the problem is they either couldn't or wouldn't defend it. 
And so every other hotel was like, oh, we're going to have rad beds too. Hilton Garden Inn got the sleep number mattress, et cetera, et cetera. So they had a talk trigger, but it didn't stick because competition came in and said, no, you can't have that one uh, to yourself. In other cases, and sometimes that happens, and you got to go back to the drawing board. Now Weston does, I think I would argue that their talk trigger is the, if you spend $5 with them, they will give you all the workout clothes, right? So they'll give you shirt, short, hat, socks, shoes, five bucks. Like that's their thing, right? Nobody else does it. Sometimes you have a talk trigger that's really effective, but then the world changes around you and it no longer works. So the best example I have of that is Enterprise Rent-A-Car, whose talk trigger for decades was, we'll pick you up. Enterprise said, we'll be the guys who pick you up, right? We'll, 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 we'll drop off the car, all that. That was awesome until Uber, <laughs> because <laughs> I, don't need, I don't need a rental card kid to drop me off when I can press a button on my phone and yeah. have anything delivered, including myself, right? So it no longer works, which is why if you look at Enterprise's TV commercials now and things like that, they don't mention that anymore because it's no longer, it Rolling. doesn't stick yeah. anymore, yeah. right? So you got to go back to the drawing board. Sometimes that happens. Hmm. But it does sort of get back to this, just this relentless, I don't want to say focus, more understanding of, of your customer. Like, yes. what makes them tick? Yeah, you, like these are going to change. There's going to be a shelf life. Someday. Yeah, so and sometimes you, you get lucky. You be in tune with Sometimes it. you get lucky like double train. You can run the same thing for 35 years, but that's the exception that proves the rule, right? And, and, but I think one of the key things that folks have to understand is that a talk trigger is not marketing. It's an operational choice that creates marketing, right? It's not a campaign. It's not a contest. It's not a coupon. It's not a promotion. It's just something that you do for everybody. And because you do it for everybody, it creates chatter. And that chatter wins you marketing points but it's not it's not a marketing strategy necessarily i mean we call it quote unquote word of mouth marketing because of the impact of it but it's different it's technical than, yeah it's yeah. it's operational right and that's one of the things i like talking about it and it really resonates with with people in businesses ceos and ops managers who aren't necessarily quote unquote marketers they get it they're like oh yeah i understand that yeah, yeah. that makes sense so in doing the research for the book, mm -hmm. you obviously found a number of brands and companies that have these talk triggers in place mm -hmm. already that have great stories to tell, mm -hmm. right? Uh, how many of those were talk triggers that were manufactured versus things that they just did just because it was great question. unique and germane to their identity anyway? Great question. I, it m Most of the ones in the book, I think, were organic. Right. They, they just, this is just, as I said, people have not had a word of mouth strategy ever, including people who accidentally found themselves with a word of mouth strategy. Right. right you know yeah. what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like they just said, oh, this is just like Cheesecake Factory. Right. The, the reasons why they have a giant menu are not necessarily so they create word of mouth. Now, that has been the byproduct of that series of decisions, but that's not why they did it. Sure. Right. They did it because the guy who started Cheesecake Factory had never worked in a restaurant. Ever. And so he decided that everything was going to be made fresh. And he decided that everything that he likes will be on the menu. And he decided that nothing ever comes off the menu. And and it's just, it's like a cult of personality. And, and, wow. and still they, to this day, like, like their CMO told me like, here's the thing about Cheesecake Factory. Nobody who's ever worked in a restaurant would run a restaurant like this because it is crazy. <laughs> it is, it is absolutely crazy how we do it. Like nobody would, would. You just couldn't do it. Every business school case study would say this is completely insane. insane. It's insane. Did you guys ever work at a restaurant when you yep. were younger? Yep. Can you? And you, did you were a server or a waiter? Mm -hmm. Yep. I remember having to memorize the Outback Steakhouse menu. Yeah. And it was the hardest thing ever. Yeah. And it wasn't that big. No, not compared to Cheesecake Factory. No. I, and and I can was you just imagine thinking, like, how long it takes them to turn tables at Cheesecake Factory? Because you yeah. just go up there, you're ready to order. Now nah, I'm gonna need some. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like I mean, it just takes a long but, time. Yeah. Okay, so let, let, let's, say, a long let's time. say it's only a minute longer yeah. than you need to read the menu. You think of a minute per table, three hundred and sixty per restaurant. Per, per let's let's say how many how many times a night? How many tables turn? Maybe six times a night. Maybe three hundred sixty five yeah. days a year. Yeah, it's a lot. That's it a serious up. amount it of time. Seriously, adds up. It adds up. So what we're hoping with this book, Chris, and you ask your question, is that if we can just get people to think more purposefully about word of mouth, then the conversation will change from, look at these companies that accidentally hit out of the park to anybody can hit out of the park. Because I really believe that. I'll give you an example. So one of our clients that Convince and Convert is this company called Superior Glove. And on the surface, not a sexy company. They're a manufacturer of work gloves. They're based outside of Toronto. And they make, it's three or 400 different types of work gloves. 
this lot. Every conceivable job, they make work gloves for that job. If you're a beekeeper, yep. If you're working on oil derrick, for sure, right? If you are uh, a carpenter, of course. Like every, I mean, like really, really specific occupations they have work gloves for. Very high quality company, family owned, been around for a long time. They are competing in a very serious way with Asian companies who provide and produce fewer types of work gloves at a lower price, but also by all accounts, lower quality. So they're being undercut by foreign competitors. So they came to us and said, we need a word of mouth program that emphasizes to our customers that we are from North America and as such provide a higher quality product. Okay. Well, the problem is you're dealing with people who are working on an oil derrick. Mm -hmm. They're not checking Facebook, right? They're, there's like no, there's, there's very little conventional marketing, digital or analog, that can get these people's attention. Like it just doesn't work like that. So it's a perfect talk trigger circumstance. So we did all the research. In fact, uh, Adam Buchanan, who you know. Yeah. Uh, we flew him out to a, a work glove conference, um, and, which exists, a thing that exists was, on this that planet, was my next um, a thing that exists, and, and uh, interviewed a bunch of people, and, and, and we talked to, did a customer interview series and a company interview series and talked to their scientists, like a bunch of like legit anthropology. Did the whole talk triggers process. So we came up with, and they, to their credit, uh, went along with it every step of the way. Here's their new talk trigger, and this is actually in the field now. Every pair of superior gloves that you buy now, uh, and typically these are not, buy, not bought by individual workers, they're bought by the purchasing manager who buys 5,000 pairs of gloves, mm -hmm. right, for their factory, and sure. then every guy just gets them from the central glove repository. Every pair of gloves on the back, uh, on the back of the gloves, um, has the superior glove logo. And if you scratch that, right, and then you go, <laughs> maple syrup. Hell yeah. Maple syrup scented scratch and, scratch and sniff maple scented work what's their, gloves. What's their URL? Where do I get superiorglove.com. Okay. I'll be happy to send you some. Uh, right? So that's awesome. I'm all in. That's the story, right? I was literally in Home Depot on Sunday with my nine year old who I dragged there, and I, yeah. I was looking for work gloves, yeah. among other things. And it's like a paradox of choice. It's crazy. If I could smell maple syrup or hunt that that's it. down. I mean, and so then you're like, you can imagine being on the factory floor and it's like, Lenny, how can we keep smelling your hands? It's like, well, <laughs> why not? This hey, smells like maple syrup. So it's a, it's a strong, I mean, it, 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 you know, that's a story that people will tell, right? And, and it, it can't be too complicated, right? It's got to be easy. And that's one of the challenges with word of mouth is that some people try and make it too complex uh, and then the story falls apart, right? Did I see you on CNBC a while back talking about L.L. Bean? Yeah, about L.L. Bean's decision to uh, change their return policy, yeah. That that was the talk trigger for 100 years? Yeah. That that was the thing. That was it. That, that was what everybody knew. That I'm was not it. familiar. What, what was it? So, you, you know, like Bean Boots and, and, and obviously they make other stuff, clothing and all other apparel, but the 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 talk trigger, what you knew, and, and like anytime you said L.L. Bean, the thing, the Lifetime guy sitting next to you at a bar that you don't even know immediately said, Lifetime warranty. They'll fix it. Oh, gotcha. Mm -hmm. And they abandoned I, I don't know the full story, but I guess they abandoned it they to did. some degree. They abandoned it. They they said, hey, we we won't give you a lifetime warranty. We'll give you, uh, a, you know, returns, no questions asked for a certain period of time. I think it's a year, but don't quote me on that. It's been a while, while ago. As long as you have a receipt. If you had to produce a receipt, uh, which you never had to produce a receipt before, you just had to, like, show up with the thing. And so what was happening, the reason they changed it, okay, so there's two two issues here. The reason they changed it, they say, is that people were going to eBay and garage sales and getting <laughs> old L.L. Bean flannel and taking it back to the store and saying, hey, I don't like this anymore. I want a brand new one. And people were flipping it, right? Well, that didn't used to happen. There wasn't a flipping culture, at least sure. the way it was now. We didn't have apps for that kind of thing. And and maybe there's been a morality shift as well. I don't want to get into that necessarily. But but it was no, it was not a problem for them. What they say... What the company says is it was costing them $30 million a year on, on, on fraudulent exchanges. That's okay. a lot of eBay stuff. That's serious money, right? Serious yeah, but, money. But is it, though, for a company that size? And that's the question. And that's and, 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 and Book, you asked the right question, which is, yeah, that sucks. 
but what's your talk trigger? What's the one and only thing that your company is known for worth? And they decided less than 30 million because mm. now while they're, while they're, policy today is still quite generous compared to most retailers. It's no longer what my friend Scott McCain would say, iconic, right? It's, it's no longer a category of one. Now they're in a category of several. And that's no longer a story. That's not a story I'm going to tell. I'm not going to say, you won't no. believe their one-year policy as long as you have a receipt. That's a shit story. It's a terrible story. It doesn't make any sense. It's yeah. not funny, interesting, or anything, right? Oh, yeah. They're yeah. the guys that used to have the lifetime Right. That's the story. We have a right? pretty good one for the group that we're in now. You know? Yeah. That's, that's yeah. That's, that, so, so that's it. So, so that's the question. It's, 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 uh, and when I say that talk triggers are an operational choice, that's a really good example of that because it's, in their case, it's truly a choice. Do we take the hit and continue to have this distinct word of mouth advantage and frankly a CX advantage? Or do we choose that that hit's not worth it anymore? And they chose the latter. And I, and I can't, I'm not, I don't have any inside information. I can't decide or determine whether that's, you know, a good or a bad decision um, economically. And I think we won't know for years, but as, as a marketer, I think it's a bad decision. So here's, here's how I may, maybe oversimplify this. And, and I'd be very interested to try to trace this back and see if we can find any correlation. But it's the PE mindset. Mm -hmm. When when you saw private equity companies and, and people of the private equity mindset starting to get involved with companies and companies started to live more on spreadsheets than they did in the minds of their consumers, you saw this shift. And you know, I would I would see this in my former life all the time. We would do something that looked so good on paper. We got thirty million dollars in returns, and we can get rid of thirty million dollars. Great. Yeah. But there's not this understanding of well, where does that live on the PMR? Where does it live off the PNL, for, mm -hmm. for that matter? In terms of how does this affect us on a yep. real basis rather than just purely as a mathematical exercise? That's it. And, and and we talked about this in the book. We interviewed a lot of word of mouth consultants and researchers and uh, academics, and and what they say, you know, every single one of them is one of the challenges with word of mouth is that it is perceived as harder to measure than than other forms of marketing. That's only partially true. But but that perception is like well I can't it's it's sort of amorphous and vague therefore I'm not going to pay attention to it. But now when fifty percent of word of mouth is online, and the other fifty percent is get it is gettable with a survey, mm -hmm. you don't really have an excuse, right? Just use analytics, right? Just use reports. Sure. Like if you want to run here, here's an idea: run a social listening report and see what keywords are used about your business. If it's free cookies, well, hmm, we got something. Earlier in the conversation, you were talking about, uh, obviously, the Maple Syrup Club mm -hmm. company that did that initial research with yep. you guys to figure out what their talk trigger should be. Yep. Enterprise that had to kind of do some research to figure out, hey, this isn't really valid anymore, yep. that the culture has changed, yep. and there's environmental factors that are, are at play. You know, to answer the question that you brought up just a moment ago, what is the talk trigger worth? Like, how? what's the cadence there in terms of how frequently... I, as a brand, should go back to the research well. Is it like a monthly exercise? Mm. Is it like a semi-annual or Great annual? How often? I don't know if I've ever been asked that. So I'm glad you Probably asked it. I'm glad I, you asked it today. I'm well, assuming so, that so, it depends on the situation. Yeah. So, so the question is, how often do you need to ratify that this still works? Well, at some point, right? this is going to have to start to play into the 10K. Like, yes. If you think about it. Like if, yes. if this becomes yes. a widely acceptable yes. thing, this is going to show up there. The theoretically, hope so. in terms of your year, and, and it should be because you, you talk yeah. about double tree and what that means. You know, what thirty eight percent unaided, mm -hmm. that is incredible. It, it's an incredible intangible asset. You I, have to be able to quantify that. Somehow. I would say if you're a brand where you have a lot of social chatter, online chatter, so it's easier to get at the veracity and and the viability of your talk trigger. I would say you want to look at it quarterly uh, and, and run those kind of social keyword reports. If you're the kind of business that that needs to do a a, a quantitative survey of customers um, to determine whether or not people are talking about it, just because they, it's just not a kind of brand, you know, no one's doing glove reviews, right? There's no there's no Yelp for work gloves. So so you know to to measure the efficacy of that would require an actual survey that they feel, and, and so in those kind of circumstances, I'd say annual. Got it. But I guess you think about it, we, like companies like Nike have to value their logo and, yeah. and, and account for that. Right. So it, it's the yeah. same mindset. Yes, at some level. Uh, although I would say that the, the one difference is that 
there's only one Nike logo. There are other companies that could have a similar target. Probably not in the same industry, but like we talked about, right? Double Tree Hotels is cookies, Beaver Creek as well, right? So it's not a category of one. Um, so the valuation's a little different, like how you think about it's a little different, right? It's not protectable. Yeah. Like you can't trademark your talk trick. Okay, fair. Because it's an operational decision. You can't be like, our trademark is a giant menu, right? So it's not really, it's not intellectual property. Well, it's like sure. Nord Nordstrom with the return thing. I don't even yeah. know if that's true at Nordstrom, but you know, was, yeah. oh, well, they'll, they'll take a set of tires back. Right, right. Yeah. But that's the story. Right. And surely it impacted top and bottom line for them. But the question is how much. I find it interesting when people create a talk trigger that they know has a shelf life, but they do it anyway because they believe that they can get its first mover advantage. Hmm. There's a business in New York called Paragon, and they're a Honda Acura dealer. And they have always had a challenge because they're in Manhattan with vehicle service. They had one garage. Uh, the challenge is like getting the cars to the garage and Manhattan traffic, and it's kind of a hassle. So their thought was, all right, well, what if we built four more garages? We sort of cover the island. I'm like, well, totally do that, and that would help our customers. But with Manhattan real estate prices, like, that's an expensive proposition. Yeah. Like, that's tricky. So then they had, a, they had an epiphany. They said, all right, well, when do our customers not need their car? When they're sleeping. So what they do now is they will pick up your car from work. They service it overnight like a bunch of elves, and they bring it back to your house in the morning so you can get back to work. So, so not only have they solved their real estate problem, but they've doubled their efficiency because now they're double shifting, sure. right? And customers love it, and it's all based on an app. It's like Uber for car maintenance. Wow. Boom, boom, boom. Brilliant, right? Now, other people are going to figure that out. There, that's not going to be a, a talk trigger very long because it's just such a good idea, but it's definitely their talk trigger now. They're the only ones who do it, and it's genius. That's, you could have used that yesterday. Yeah, yeah that's, a res, that's <laughs> oh, yeah. what we call a responsiveness talk trigger. But right? is, it's is so there a fast. life cycle to this where it's like, all right, you get the first mover advantage, and then maybe some other people key in on it? I guess some people are going to yeah. say, hey, cookies, cool. Let's get into the cookie action. But then you've got this little phase here where you might execute a little better. Or you mm -hmm. get a little bit of a halo effect from from being the first yep. mover. Yep. And and then it starts to go. To I, I think it, it's a good question. I think it really depends on on what it is and the industry and kind of what customers expect, right? Because some of the best ones, some of the best ones could be knocked off, and they're not they're not really complicated operationally. One of the very signature stories in the book, and I tell this on stage all the time because I just love it is and I think it's probably the best example of a talk trigger that really people are like I get it now there's a, a restaurant in Sacramento called Skip's Kitchen and it's a counter service hamburger restaurant so you walk in you go to the menu board I want two patty melts and onion rings and chocolate. when your food's ready they bring it to your table pretty simple business however what they do is when you finish ordering they whip out a deck of cards from underneath the counter and they fan the cards out face down and they say pick <laughs> and you pick a card and if you get a joker your entire meal is free oh wow whether it's for you or you've got eight people in your party doesn't matter totally free now they have spent zero dollars on advertising in the 10 years they've been open they've never bought an ad there's a line to get in almost every single day they were just named the 29th best hamburger restaurant in america by USA Today without ever having advertised. And the way they do it is that their talk trigger is so strong and it's so pervasive, that's all they need. 3.5 people a day win on average. And when they win, they go batshit crazy, man. They're like taking... Telling everybody. They're yeah. taking patty melt selfies and calling their mom and like yeah. a high school marching band shows up and they're like, you know, on Yelp and TripAdvisor. And it doesn't matter if you won. If you're there when somebody won... Sure. You're Party. telling that story over. You won't believe what happened to me at lunch today. A guy won the joke. <laughs> but the funny thing is, so like Steve's diner across the street could do the same thing. Anybody could. It's not going could. to get the same impact. From Anybody. Him. Well, I mean. Presumably not. I mean, it's it's never going to catch on. I mean, being first same certainly degree. helps, right? Because if. It, There's if, a little bit of an insulation. Yeah. It's like, you know, Chris, you've heard me say this. Like, if if all you want to do is play fall on the leader, you will never be better than second best. It's not mathematically possible, right? And if all you care about are averages, you'll never be anything other than an average marketer. So at some level, 
stealing somebody else's talk trigger might work kind of, but it's not going to work great because people just won't know you. I mean, it works so good for skips that <laughs> they have a giant neon sign. I have a picture of it in my presentation. It's a giant neon sign out front that says Skip's Kitchen. Despite that, most people in Sacramento call it that Joker restaurant. Yeah. I was going to say. Right? It's they like, have like Joker cards. Yeah. It's like that's their thing, right? Um, and it's just such a good idea. And, and, and Skip was a guy who used to be the regional manager for Chili's. And he's like, I want to do my own thing. And he did. Is there some, something to be said here for the importance of talk triggers in businesses that are not heavily differentiated? What I mean sure. by that is, of course. Wait, and so what I mean by that is, it. I mean, it's it's clearly got to be more important when you're in the restaurant business, or even even the skiery business. Hundred skierias, yes, they're all exact same product, pretty much. You get up on a lift, you ski down a mountain, you have a drink, you do. Yeah, the same I mean, thing if your business there. is already differentiated because it exists, you don't need a talk trigger. So Theoretically, that's the your fact talk that your business. Yeah, the fact that you are in business. Like, okay, like uh, this is off the top of my head, uh, which is probably not the right way to do this, but. Like there's businesses, uh, including here in Phoenix, that that will pick up dog poop for money. The fact that that business exists is a talk trigger. They don't need a they don't need a talk trigger on top of the fact that they will pick up dog poop for money, right? That that is like their 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 thing. Their their being on this planet yeah. is a story, right? And so we have to remember that 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 all of this is about storytelling. We all want to tell stories to our friends that are like, wow, dude, that's awesome. And, and so we, we don't want to make it so academic that we lose sight of that, that ultimately it's about you and me in a bar. And you're like, you won't believe what happened to me when dot, dot, dot. Yeah, let, let's that's keep this art and trigger. not make it science. And well, it's, like it is definitely everything. science. I think it's one of the reasons why we wrote the book, because there's lots of books about word of mouth that are only art. And that's not super helpful. There's a lot of books that say, and good books too. And 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 look, we are standing on the shoulders of giants here. It's not like Daniel and I invented the idea of word of mouth marketing. By far, we did not. Tremendous books and great thought leaders in the in the industry. But what we haven't had so far is, I agree, word of mouth is important. Now, how do I do it? Yeah. Right. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to add to the conversation is is equal parts art and then a process that you can actually follow. Because without a process, it's like, yeah, that does sound like something I should do. So when. When you work with a company and you're dealing specifically with talk triggers, is is the I imagine the first phase of this is almost walking it back and saying, first, let's get to know your customers. Let, let's get to understand. Hundred percent. Is is that just the logical one? A hundred percent. Because the secret ingredient for all of this is awareness. Like if you don't really understand what your customers think and need and act and want, then then you might get lucky. And, and get a good one, but probably not, you know, it, 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 there is a lot of anthropology to this, which is why I like it. You know, I almost majored in American anthropology when I was in college. And, uh, so I'm really digging this word of mouth consulting side and strategy development because it, it, it appeals to my, you know, let's figure out how we can create stories, right? Create, create stories that, that people will tell over and over. Like, a, like, one of the sections in the book is this idea of what's the difference between a USP, a unique selling proposition, and a talk trigger. Hmm. And a USP is something that you talk about with a bullet point in a board. And a talk trigger is something you talk about with wine in a bar. Right? It's a story, not it's, it's, a, it's a story, not a benefit. You can't but wait that that also yeah. accurately just, depicts just how much more powerful a talk trigger is. Can be. Yeah. Should be. Save. You know, the, the average person is not sitting in a sit, sitting in a boardroom having that discussion. And we've and, and what's interesting when we work with clients on this, a lot of times they conflate those two, and they say, "Well, we our talk trigger is the thing that we do that's twenty percent faster than our competitors." I'm like, bro, nobody cares. No, that's not. I mean, they care if they've already bought it, or they care if they're low funnel, but that's not a story that your customer will tell to their friend. They're not going to be like, man, these guys are 20% faster, right? It's just, that's just not how people communicate, right? You know, and, and it's, almost, it's, it's, the, it's the verbal tradition, right? If people can't describe your talk trigger to their friends and their eyes don't light up in two sentences, you don't have it. It's not there yet, right? And that's what it is. It's two sentences, eyes light up. 
That's it. There's got to be like a buddy in a bar metric for that. That's it, right? And that's, I mean, and and that's actually Ted Wright who wrote the forward for the book who wrote Fizz and is in is the quintessential uh, word of mouth genius in this country. Uh, I will never know what he knows about word of mouth. He's the guy who, among many, many, many other things, um, popularized PBR. Hmm. He was hired by PBR to make PBR hipster and cool and certainly succeeded. He was also the guy who invented chocolate milk as an athletic recovery drink, which now every kid drinks chocolate milk. That was also his client. Um, Bless his heart. A genius. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's funny because it's just pure sugar. An absolute <laughs> genius, right? Um, so so Ted uh, really talks about that idea of buddy in a bar, right? And he's like, look, if you have a, think you have a talk trigger, what you do is you get like six friends together for lunch. You're like, hey, what about this? And you just see if they're like, way that's amazing then yeah there's a wow if they're just like meh they don't have it so does this mean i could have written off the seven meals a week i ate at harry carey's in chicago yes probably it's not too late amend your return (laughs) can i go back to 2013 (laughs) absolutely well that's a good example though like (laughs) what do you what do you think about when you think about that place when i think about harry's yeah I think about the BS discussions about seemingly innocuous things. That... No, but like what would they like the one thing I think about that's coming to mind is that gigantic bust of Harry Carey's head that everybody and their brother takes a picture of right. in front of them you know, uh-huh. as you walk in and then you go to the right to drink and you go to the left to eat and drink. So yeah, there, there's a couple things. Um, I don't know if this necessarily classifies a talk trigger. But I mean, you know the story of me at Harry's and the reason why I went there and ultimately referred so many people there over the years is because when back when I was at Mighty and, and my friend was sick and, and right before he passed away, he's a big Cubs fan. Mm-hmm. We went to Harry's and one of the bartenders there had heard about my, my buddy being sick and set up a dinner with Ernie Banks and Ryan Sandberg for him right before he passed away. That's amazing. Guy never took and, and, and God bless Frank. He 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 you know, basically made my friend's life at the end there. But, you know, that's something that me, even living in Phoenix for all these years in LA before I went back to Chicago, was always telling people out. When I got back to Chicago, every business meeting I had was at Harry's. Every night out, even if we weren't eating dinner there, we met at Harry's Mm -hmm. for that. Yep. No. It's good. I mean, I I guess that's not like like an emotional connection, though. It it is. And that's not necessarily a talk trigger, but that's just, those are the unique experiences that that people talk about. It's like, you know, when, you know, you go to Belgium or something, everyone says, oh, I'm going to Belgium. And you're rushing out to say, no, 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 you got to go to these three places because yeah. they're amazing. You know, like you want to make sure people experience it the way you did. Los Dos Molinos here in the Valley in the super hot salsa. Yeah. That's her talk. And a fantastic pitcher of margarita. And a fantastic pitcher of margarita, which is deceptively strong. Sounds good right about now. It's only 108 degrees today. This has been awesome. Cool. Glad says, you guys like yeah. it. We never really started the show, did we? Well, we didn't officially start the show. We can do it now. <laughs> um, that said, though, we should officially close it. So, first before, of all, before we do, real quick, I have a very specific tactical question yes, for sir. you that I think some people might be wondering. When you guys do your analysis of the social chatter, yeah, what do you use? What tool or tools? So, it depends on the industry. Right. So a combination of a social listening platform, right, okay. which uh, might be Brandwatch, we use Cision a lot now, uh, some sort of social listening platform of which there are many. Uh, and then depending on the industry, we will tap into, if there are a ratings and reviews platform for that category of business, we'll absolutely look at that. And then we'll do a lot of discussion board and forum research as well, which can be really specific to that industry. Got also, it. so it's kind of that triangle in terms of online stuff. It's social listening using whatever tool you prefer. Uh, it would be ratings and reviews analysis, and then discussion boards analysis. Got it. Cool. And then you marry that with, of course, um, inside the company conversation, right? So talking to sales folks, talking to customer service folks. We call it the triangle of awesome in the book, which is marketing, sales, customer service. Yeah, that's cool. The- the book is Talk Triggers. It comes out when? October 2nd, officially. Pre-order available now. Perfect. Right after your birthday. Yes. Yes. Which is, I should bring this up. He is September 29th? 28th. No, you're, you're 29th. the 29th. Yes. And you're, you're the, 30. You're the 28th. Yeah, there you go. That's yeah. crazy. 
Yes. Yeah. Libra's we're, in the house. We're, we're going to have to make one of these. Libra, we should just, yeah, we should have a show, just a, a, a podcast, which is only, you know, Libra's on marketing or something like that. <laughs> and just like, yeah. It's not a bad idea. Yeah. And, anyway, we, and we, the only people who can be on the show are other Libras, right? It's right. a very specific guest profile. Balanced oh, conversation. Very exclusive. Yeah, that's it. Very exclusive. <laughs> you have to apply to be on the show to show your, show your ID. Yeah. Very good. Well, he's Jay Bayer. Pick up the book, Talk Triggers. Definitely pre-order it. That certainly You will helps. know it because it's the only business book that is A, hot pink, and B, has alpacas on the cover. The book itself is a talk trigger. A, because it has alpacas Absolutely. on the cover. And B, I'm trying to figure out a way to put that it in It has there. alpacas on the cover, which is a talk trigger. And B, the other talk trigger is Daniel and I uh, convinced our publisher, I don't know how, a moment of weakness for them, to do something that's never been done in the history of business books. On the back cover. Big, big, big notice. If you do not love this book, send an email here, and we will buy you any other book of your choice ever published. I love it. That's a strong. talk trigger right That's there, That's a talk trigger, buddy. That's damn strong. Right in, like, uh, a la L.L. Bean. Daniel said, day. what if somebody wants us to buy him, like, a $1,000 cookbook? And I said, God, I hope that happens because I'll, <laughs> I'll have a press release written in 30 seconds. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. So once again, that's Talk Triggers by Jay Bayer and Daniel Lemon. Pick that up today. We guarantee that you're going to like it. I guarantee. Book. These guys can't guarantee anything, but I guarantee you're going to like it. And if you don't, I'll buy another book. And, I and really you're going to be speaking in a lot of different places here coming Man, up. Man, all over. It's like all over. September, October is that time of year, right? Yeah. Where I'll be in the content be? marketing world, uh, all, of course, in Cleveland. Uh, I'll, be, I'm doing a, I'll be back here in Phoenix in September to do the uh, annual Caterpillar, Caterpillar dealer conference. So talking to people who sell tractors about talk triggers. Yeah, I'm psyched about that. So yeah, I'm everywhere, all kinds of crazy stuff. Can we come tag along with you that day? I would love to be there. That'd be fun. Yeah, I absolutely. Would love that. Be a good one. Be good yeah. One. So anybody can find you, obviously, uh, at Jay Bear on Twitter, on Instagram, anywhere else. Are You are the, what, most retweeted digital marketer I was at one the point world? the most retweeted digital... Um, the most retweeted person among digital marketers uh, in the world at one point. I don't know if that's still true, but it was. And you are point. now in the Speaking Hall of Fame. Professional Speaker Hall of Fame. Congratulations. Thank you, yeah, man. I appreciate awesome. that. There's 185 living members, so it's a it's an exclusive group. It's uh, Yeah, it's crazy. It's weird to be in that group. That event must have been fun. Yeah. You got to bring... Fun. Whole family was there. Yeah, yeah awesome. it was really neat. That, that it's, that's, it was a, a blast. Deal. Thank you. Uh, and yeah, you can listen to my show, too, if you don't love this show. Which yeah. you do. This show's the best. Check out Social Pros. Yep. De- definitely recommend it. Anyway, you, Jay Bear, a guy that is, uh, for both Chris and myself, meant a uh, whole hell of a lot in our career. True story. Thanks, boys. Absolutely. So anyway, that's been episode 21 for Mayhem to Measurement. If you have any questions, drop us a line, infometricsagency.com. Find us Twitter, LinkedIn, wherever else. And we will see you next time. Talk to you next time. Yeah.